What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Backpacking Podcast, brought to you by Outdoor Vitals. As always, myself, John Kelly, I'm here with Jeremiah Stringer, and we want to say a big thank you to our title sponsor, Outdoor Vitals, makers of the Ventus hoodie, which, Jeremiah, I believe you are a personal big fan of yourself. Actually, I do own the Ventus hoodie. I love it. Y'all should definitely check it out. It comes from the Latin word for wind. And I think that's a pretty accurate description because it has vents all down the side. So you'll stay nice and breezy. You're not going to sweat. You can move in it. And it's a good breathable piece, but it'll keep you warm because it's an insulated hoodie. That's right. And if you guys use the web address outdoorvitals.com slash BP hoodie, you can get that for $30 off, including a free two and a half ounce pillow. And given who we're having on here today, having ultralight gear is very important. Uh, so big thank you to Outdoor Vitals for that. And Jeremiah, today we uh, we kind of have ultralight royalty on here today. <laughs> I know, man. This guy, <laughs> the accolades are endless. Uh, one being an author, which I have his book here I do called well. Take Less, Do More, Surprising Life Lessons. Uh, That's releasing this week, I believe, right? Yes, and uh, we'll talk more about it here in just a minute, I'm sure. Uh, an adventurer, a backpacker, a gear creator, an ultralighter at heart. Yeah, and and a guy who was thinking about this stuff when nobody else was. So, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, this rolls way back. This is going to be good stuff, and he's probably going to make us look silly because he probably has forgotten more about backpacking than we know. Well, dude... I like hanging out with people that make me better. I'm, so, I'm right there with you, man. So we ready to bring this guy on? Absolutely. Folks, welcome to the show. Founder of Gossamer Gear, ultralight backpacker and author, Mr. Glenn Van Pesky. How's it going, man? Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we're really glad to have you on here. This is just an honor to have you here. Um, real quick, I got to know, um, what was it like? I, I read your part of your book where you talked about being the boy scouts with your son but what was it like being able to learn kind of the backpacking ropes alongside of your son that was a lot of fun it was important to me to do that and really um some someone asked me because i started kind of my first big adventure was 1976 rode my bicycle cross country and then i stayed on the west coast and so this guy's asking well so, you know, you were in the mountains and doing caving and river and ocean, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, not really. No, I was, you know, going to school, building a career and starting a family. And so it was really when our son Brian joined Boy Scouts that I got back into outdoor, outdoor gear and outdoor adventures. Yeah, I, I loved reading about you going into an REI and looking at all this gear, getting it all home, putting it all together. And then you're like, hey, let's weigh it and see what we got <laughs> and it was 70 plus pounds of of gear on your back yeah yeah when we left for that week in the sierra with food and water it was 70 pounds <laughs> i i gotta tell you i had a similar experience on my first trick it is amazing by the way just how many people uh they they really get deep into backpacking through the boy scouts it's amazing like how many dads get like drug into the mud through it and I think that kind of happened with with me and my father-in-law. He invited me on my first trip, and I remember borrowing all this gear. I was in the best shape of my life, you know, 22, 23 years old, just waiting to go. And I remember going out there, and my backpack was like 55 pounds, and I'd done, uh, you know, 40 or 50 miles through the Smoky Mountains. And I remember the first day, well, we got there at like 11 o'clock, and I just walked uphill straight for 10 miles and didn't get to that shelter until nighttime. At the end of the trip, I think I brought home probably like six pounds of food. I had a full jar of peanut <laughs> butter still with me. I mean, <laughs> it's miserable. So at what point did you decide, okay, this is heavy. There has to be a better way to do it. Well, the, the genesis of that was really Ray Jardine's original book, uh, the Pacific Crest Trail Hiker's Handbook. And my buddy, Reed Miller, who was the scoutmaster um, of our local troop, he read it and he says, oh, Glenn, you got to read this thing. It's mind blowing. Um, 
And so we started, uh, you know, started working on lightning packs. And it was important because a lot of the Boy Scouts, when they first cross over, they're young and some of them were small. Um, and so we'd go through their gear. And I remember one shakedown trip we're doing on the Pacific Crest Trail. It was just like an overnight. And so we were standing around a picnic table, kind of all the adult leaders trying to go through these guys' gear. And so we went through this one kid's pack, little guy, and we took all this stuff out. And finally, we okay, let's ready to go. And and um, I noticed this one kid carrying a trash bag full of stuff. Plus, he's got his backpack on. And I said, what's in the bag? He said, well, that's all the stuff that didn't fit in my pack. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, we got to Hang on, we're starting over here. <laughs> yeah, so it was it was a process, definitely. Yeah, I actually helped a Boy Scout a couple of years ago. He was getting ready to go out to uh, Philmont, which actually there's there's a question um, that that was asked by Riff Outdoors. Uh, did you ever make it out to Philmont? No, my son Brian did though. Yeah, they say that's a pretty fun hike. They say that's a that's a really great trip. Um, but I was I was helping one of these students out. You're gonna love this. And he comes up and he shows me his pack and he said, yeah, it was, it was my dad's pack. And I was like, oh, really? He goes, yeah. He hands it to me and it's, it's an old Kelty external frame backpack nice. with the big that's... metal frame on it. And I mean, I just looked at him. I said, wow, man, that's, are you excited about using it? And he goes, no. <laughs> and so, so um i've got i've got a bunch of extra gear and i like i'll let people borrow my stuff so he ended up actually taking my pack and uh and uh yeah just these stories that you, you tell stories in this book and i don't want to give too much away because i want people to be able to read this for themselves but the stories of people coming out on their early backpacking trips and the stuff they're bringing and um it, it's amazing just just the evolution for all of us because I think every one of us starts off with a 50 to 70 pound backpack when we get started. Um, and then after a few years of dialing things in, we kind of figure it out. Um, what I want to know what got you to make your own like gear, like what got you actually thinking about that? What was the inspiration behind starting that? Because we all know you were the, you, you were the founder of Gossamer gear, which makes incredible gear actually it makes one of my favorite things in the world their umbrella, like of all things, I love the umbrella from Gossamer gear, but, uh, what got you started making gear? Well, uh, my mom thought every kid should leave home knowing how to do three things, uh, how to cook, how to bake and how to sew. Huh. And it didn't matter whether you were a boy or a girl, those, she just considered those basic life skills. Um, and so I knew how to sew. Um, in fact, in 1976, when I, uh, graduated high school and rode my bicycle across the country. Uh, I sewed myself a tarp. So I was already kind of making my own gear. And then it seemed natural 30, 40 years later when my son was in Boy Scouts and uh, my buddy read Ray Jardine's book. It's like, well, I can make a pack. I actually had one of those when I was in Boy Scouts, had one of those Kelty external frame packs. Nice. And I swear it was lighter than what they sold me back for the Sierra Trek when I went in because it was the new thing was the internal frames and I don't know how it would move with your body or yada 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 and that thing weighed seven and a half pounds empty and I would have I wish I'd still had my old Kelty I would have taken that but um, yeah so I started I started sewing packs I figured you know I looked at that seven and a half pound pack and said well that's a good place to start. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you went through tons of generations of it before you finally settled on the G4. Is that right? Well, that was pack number four. That's why it's called the G4. That was the fourth one I made. You know, if you're if you're an engineer and it, it doesn't have to be in your job title, I can tell by looking at people. It's like, yeah, I see you. You're an engineer. I don't care what's on your business card. Like, I know how you I know how you are. Um, you know, when you, when you have something, it's like you, you keep thinking about how to make it better. And so I was always, I, I made my first pack and it was, thing was huge. It was light, but it was huge. Um, and so I'd hike along thinking about like, ah, I bet I could make this better and this would work better if I did it this way. And so I'd make another pack. And today I always tell people, sometimes I'll be speaking and someone will come up and say, oh, 
I made my own pack. And I said, that's great. Just know it won't be the last one you make. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. I believe it. I believe it. The, you, you mentioned a couple of times about this, uh, bike, this bike trip where you and some buddies pretty much biked across the country. And, uh, am I right that that is kind of the genesis of the big adventures that you took? Yeah, that was the first one. And, you know, probably my biggest adventure to date, actually. Um, actually, so the the book actually comes out tomorrow and we're having a virtual launch party. And uh, one of the guys that signed up is actually one of those guys who in 1976 rode across the country with me, Guy Halapa. And he wants to do a trip, the 50 year anniversary called Complete the Loop and then write a book about that, which I think would be awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you already say yes? Well, you know, I, you guys married? I'm yes. married. Yes. I've been, yeah, oh, wow. I've been married almost 42 years. So <laughs> sometimes you have to kind of release information like a bit at a time. Yeah. You know, like, so you don't get the straight no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to let it leak through. We're well, in discussions. <laughs> the That's so awesome. you, you this book will only hold so much right it's it's a snapshot it's got a lot of great life lessons i'm curious about on this bike trip that you took you you said it was what year 1976 okay so we live in a totally different time now with like gps and uh you know if you need anything or anything goes wrong you can typically just call or text somebody or find a way the world is so small i'm curious other than the things that you put in the book, is there anything from that trip that, that comes to mind that you wish you could add in the book or that, you know, would be, would be something that you learned or a difficulty that you went through that you just didn't have quite the room to fit in the book? You know, I didn't take any notes from that summer which I don't know why sometimes you can go too light. Yeah. Yeah. Probably would have been nice to have some notes. Luckily, um, guy took some notes. So, so he has a journal from that summer. Um, and it boggles my mind now to think back like at 17, I thought it would be a good idea to get on a bicycle with no helmet, 10 speeds, no <laughs> cell phone, no GPS, no nothing and ride across the country. And I was going to do it by myself. And then, you know, three buddies said, well, that sounds like a great idea. Um, can we come? So sure. Um, but yeah, we took a big map of the United States, like a car map with the major highways, took a highlighter from one end to the other and drew a blue line. And then when we got to each state, this was still when they gave out paper maps at gas stations for free which I know is just crazy talk. Um, and then we'd, we'd get into that state and kind of look at our overall map and look at the state map and kind of figure out where we were going. Um, in terms of stories that didn't make it, I don't know, I got most of the high points. There was, uh, I'm trying to think, I think all the, probably everything I remember is in the book because there wasn't, you know, I didn't have any notes. Yeah, that That's makes great. sense. So, you went from bike, was it, would you consider it bike packing? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, we were, we had, we didn't stay in hotels. I, I think maybe once or twice. I don't remember that, but it's in, in the notes. Um, and we would buy, you know, Burger King for lunch when we, so we, we weren't, we're doing a lot of cooking that I remember sometimes oatmeal in the morning, I think. Um, but we were, yeah, we were camping out. I so mean, it wasn't okay. in the woods. We were along old state highways and stuff like that. So just out of curiosity, you're 17 years old. You're still high school kids. What were your parents thinking about you guys just riding across the country? <laughs> that's, that's, a, listen, I, I'm a, I'm a parent and I'm sitting here thinking, am I going to let my 17 year old kid just give us some buddies and go right across the country on a bike? You know, so what was, I mean, how did you guys convince your parents to let you go do that ride? Well, um, my 
uh, my parents were divorced. So, uh, my mom was, I was with my mom on the East coast, uh, Western Massachusetts. And she figures I've, I've talked to my brother and sister and we all felt this. She swears she never said it, but somehow we all got the message that when you're 18, when you graduate high school, you're gone. Like she has given you all the skills you need and it's time to go make your way. And so we called her twice in the six weeks, or I called her twice in the six weeks uh, that it took to go across and she was unperturbed each time. I mean, she figured she'd given me all the skills I needed to make my way and I would mm -hmm. figure it out. And has wow. your sons asked if uh, they can do anything wild like this in their adolescence? No, I mean, you know, Brian's a pretty big adventure. He'll say, yeah, I'm, you know, going to New Zealand and renting a van and traveling around doing some hiking for a while. It's like, that's great. You know, send pictures. Yeah. Well, awesome. how did it that's go great. from you took this massive trip to one day you're turning into somebody that's making their own backpacking gear, you know, your own backpack. So totally different than the other stuff out there. And of course you talk a lot about it in the book, um, especially about your gear and stuff. So how did it morph into on foot instead of on the bike? You know, I think it was because of Boy Scouts. I mean, I, you know, I kind of hung up the bike when I got to the West Coast. I drove down the, down the coast um, and stayed, was staying at my dad's house and had vague kind of plans of going back and being an interpreter. I liked languages and, you know, this was pre-internet, so you couldn't really research anything. You just had these dumb ideas and no one to tell you they were dumb. Um, but a buddy of my dad's uh, had a small civil engineering uh, land development business and they needed someone to draft. And so they knew my dad was really smart and they figured, well, I couldn't be too dumb. So they <laughs> hired me to, uh, you know, to draft and so with that, they offered me $3 and 50 cents an hour. And that was like more money than I had ever thought about in my life. What so, year was this? This was 1976. Okay. Oh, yeah. That was, that was definitely over the uh, minimum wage. <laughs> yeah. That was like big money. So I, you know, chucked my dreams of becoming an interpreter and said, yeah, I'll draft. And you know, that I ended up becoming a civil engineer just from that fluke encounter. Wow. I That's do, cool. I do hear, I do want to hear more about the, uh, the morphing into backpacking, but you did bring up languages just there. And I know your love for Japanese. I'm just curious, are you fluent in multiple languages or do you learn kind of like the travel lingo and you can get around in a lot of different countries? How's that work? You know, um, I don't know if you found this just cause you like something doesn't mean you're any good at it. Uh, like I had a, <laughs> I've been there. That's fair. I, had, That's fair. I had a roommate once who actually our oldest son, Brian is named after him. Um, had a roommate called Brian and, and he loved to sing. Um, but he came home. Like I remember like perplexed one day cause they asked him not to come to choir anymore. <laughs> Just like, he didn't understand why, you know? So, so, long way of saying is like, no, I'm not fluent in anything. I took French, Latin and Greek in high school. Um, and I'm surprised how much French actually kind of stuck. We were in France a few years ago, um, at an Airbnb and she only knew French, but, and I was able to kind of, you know, we could figure out what we needed to. Um, yeah. it's amazing how, how little like of each other's languages you could know. And through a little bit of charades and a little bit of communication, like my wife and I, we did the Camino de Santiago, which goes across Spain. And we yeah. did like the full 1000 K, you know, oh, over yeah. the summer. And we are not formally trained in, in Spanish. 
I mean, you're I very, took, you're, for, you're not formally trained in English half the time, man. Dude, I went to Chick Fil A. We call it linguistic racism on here. <laughs> we he calls because, me a linguistic racist. Yeah, because my accent, I talk, and sometimes my wife can't understand me, and we're from the same hometown. I don't know what it is. I went to Chick Fil A on Friday and got us some dinner, and the girl. She said, what's the name on the order? I said, Jeremiah. And I went to pick it up and I was the only one in line. And the girl at the front, different girl, just kept saying, Jamel, Jamel. <laughs> and I was like, Jamel. And I look around and I'm the only one there. And I said, is it a number one and a number seven? She's like, it sure is. I said, it's Jeremiah. She said, not today. She said, it's Jamel. <laughs> handed me the bag. <laughs> think not myself, today. Man. Glenn, one of our favorite words on this podcast is vestibule. <laughs> yeah, I say vestibule. He, he, for the longest time, Jeremiah called it a vegetable. So <laughs> <laughs> they like. To make I, I give him, I give him crap all the time. But the truth, it he can say vestibule now. So yeah, that's good. We're very proud of him. We're very proud of him. I'm always hey. looking for ways to improve myself. What were you going to say, John? Well, speaking of words, we have a question on here. <laughs> Uh, who was, what was the genesis of the company name Gossamer for Gossamer gear? Actually, that was my wife, Francie. Really? She just informed me, reminded me of that the other day. Yes. So, so what was it that, that brought that on then? Is it just, she just liked the, the name or? Well, I was talking about, and I might've been, this was probably had the internet thing on us by then. I was probably looking at words that meant like light and airy and stuff like that. Cause the original, you know, originally I was only going to get 25 packs made. And so I just called it GVP gear. My initials is like, you, you know, when, when this is going to be a two month effort, you don't put too much trouble into picking a name. Right. Um, but when it became clear that well, this was going to be go on for longer than I thought, Okay, we really, you know, we need a real name here. So yeah, we're just kicking around words and it's got the G thing going for it. So I like that and double G, you know, Gossamer gear. We didn't quite get to garage grown gear, you know, three G's. That's kind of the holy grail, but we were close. <laughs> hey, you mentioned in your, your book about a company like garage grown gear. I don't remember the name of it. But you said that when you first started, they kind of like gave you a platform. Do you remember what it's called? Uh, it was Craig Delger was the guy. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but basically they did the same thing Gossamer gear is, right? Well, same thing, garage grown gear, kind of. Yeah, they were kind of um, amassing, like they had a platform that they were trying to get other companies to kind of use. Gosh, what was the name of that? Um, like pro light gear or something. I forget. That's a good question. That's pretty cool. And well, I, I actually have a question for you about your gear. So we were talking earlier about you had the gen one, the G2, the G3, G4. Well, you're still involved in helping design gear today, right? I am. I, you know, if I need something like I needed a shelter that was bug proof for doing a 900 miles on the great divide, you know, yeah. real bike packing. And, you know, we didn't, the one was going to be too heavy and bulky for me. So I said, well, I need a new tent. So I think I made 12 prototypes in Tyvek before I started putting uh, DCF together and finally came up with uh, the Whisper. And I used it on, used it on that trip and a couple others. Um, and anytime I come up with a piece of gear, the, the first question when we get the design group together is, okay, does anyone think there's five people in the world besides Glenn that thinks this piece of gear is a good idea? <laughs> well, I've got a question about a specific piece of gear that I, that I was on the okay. Gossamer Gear website, and it's this new PVT system. Are you part of, of putting that together? I am not. That's people way smarter than me. <laughs> and well, a little just... heavier than me, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say I I, I was looking at it, and uh, it's it's just it looks interesting to me, um, just the the way it's all set up and and just the it just the stability of it. It seems like it, it, it now like you said it's probably a little heavier than what you would carry, 
But just from everything I saw, it just seems like it does a great job of transferring weight. It looks like it would make the pack really comfortable. So It is pretty amazing. We've gotten some great feedback from early users on it. Um, it's it's real. And one of the amazing things about it is the, the function um, with as light as it is. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to tell you, speaking of gear, the Gossamer gear, um, I have two, well, probably one likely candidate for my pa favorite piece of GG gear. And then one that you would never, ever guess in a million years, I don't think. Crotch and I, <laughs> that would be a good one. <laughs> that would be a good one. I read that and I said, hmm, yeah, I don't think that's for me. <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we were just, we were talking to Backcountry Foodie who, uh, she runs like a, a channel on Instagram and stuff where she does some backpacking nutrition stuff and like ships people food or sets up menus and stuff for them. And she went hard and heavy on the cold soaking. And basically I was informed that I just wasn't doing it right because I was trying to cold soak foods that should be eaten hot whenever I should have been cold soaking foods that are nice cold. You need the crotch pot, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> you, want to, you want to tell everybody that's, that's uninformed about this crotch pot image of, of yours? Well, this, this happened and Ron Moak will swear it's his invention. Don't believe him. Um, we, we did for a, for, for a few years, we did, um, what we kind of jokingly called the brain trust hike. And it was whoever could make it. It was kind of the early ultralight gear guys. It was Ron Moak, a six moon designs, uh, myself, Henry Shires, a tarp tent and Brian Frankel of ULA designs. And so, we were doing, I think it was the Tahoe Rim Trail, pretty sure. And um, yeah, Tahoe Rim Trail. And we're engaging in the normal trash talking about weight and what matters and stuff like that. And we start talking about cooking and, and how heavy that is and how you should just be able to use your body heat. And, you know, what's the hottest part of your body? You know, obviously if you're cold, you know, if your hands are cold, where do you put them in your sleeping bag, you know, in your crotch. So, so we started kidding around and joking on this and I thought, well, no time like the present to test this out. So I took my dinner, put it in a Ziploc bag and slipped it into my pants and then, you know, just kind of <laughs> flipped the top of the bag over. So it didn't like fall out one of my legs and I'm hiking along and I thought, well, I should like check on it here. And, um, so when I pulled it out, the top ripped off and I almost ended up wearing my dinner, but was able to extricate it before it completely ripped off. And so that was the start of the crotch bud. But yeah, basically it's kind of the, the third way, you know, between cold soak and cooking. Um, <laughs> and can you give me uh a couple of great recipes that, that work well for that crotch pot. Cause she was saying like pasta salad would be a good thing to cold soak or something like that. Maybe not so much something that's supposed to be hot. What, it, what would be great at lukewarm? See pasta could be good. The, the trick is you want something like mashed potatoes are bad, uh, because they soak up the water right away and then it's harder for your body to heat the water. So you want something that takes time to rehydrate. So, as you heat the water, it's also hydrating, rehydrating your meal. So I think pasta would work. And that's actually, so we met on a Boy Scout trip in San Jacinto Mountains. Early, this is way, way long ago. Um, I remember meeting a through hiker. He was wearing like short shorts and like a tiny little day pack. And, you know, we're there with the scouts. We're all loaded down and and uh we're talking to him reed and i and he's got like a ziploc bag of ramen in the back of his neck like kind of in his hoodie there and we're like what's going on with that and he says ah i was hiking with two other guys but i could only do 20 miles a day so they left me and they have the stove and you know we're trying to wrap our heads around 20 miles a day and then thinking about like yeah, and ramen, like in the back of your neck, that's all he had to like cook the ramen. But, you know, that, I think that stuck with me. And that's kind of like, you just move a little lower, get a little hotter and 
away you go. Well, if only he had the intuition you have. I think so. <laughs> he, could have, he could have been the inventor of the crotch pot and not he even know. Been. He probably was. I think my favorite thing about the crotch pot is, and I'm going to put this up on the screen again for people who are, who are on here, is the illustrations on how to use it. Um, <laughs> put the water in the dry food into the crotch pot. Drop it down into the front of your pants. Hike off like a happy camper. Look at it cooking. And then at the end of the day, yum, all done. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. I remember when it first came out, I didn't think it was real. You know, like an April Fool on April 1st, companies we, will make those did, April 1st things. We and, did launch it on April 1st. It yes. was we we're very proud of the joke within a joke. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just assumed, okay, this is a joke. And then after it was over, it was still selling. <laughs> I was like, wait, this is a real thing. It's so a real thing. that's fantastic. Unbelievable. That's fantastic. Well, let me but say Jeremiah, I Jeremiah, yeah. I don't think I, and I, I probably didn't answer your question. I had, I had big dreams early on for the crotch pod, like a subscription service, like a recipe club, but you know, it just never quite took off like that. So maybe I need to get with backcountry foodie and come up with like a, a crotch pot friendly line or something. Like food line. There you go. There's there you market. go. <laughs> There's some more recipes, you know, that would be good. Yeah. Like a crotch pot oh. recipe book. Can you yeah. imagine the crotch pot recipe book? Just call it the crotch recipes. <laughs> That won't be weird at all. That won't be strange at all for people. Not for hikers. No. <laughs> not for, it's true. Not for hikers. John, so, I was going through the comments here, and I think uh, our first our first comment, unless I'm wrong here. Oh, I saw it too. The, I saw it too. Let me get to it because I know what you're getting ready to say. So maybe it was my goldfish drown. It is my goldfish drown. It is a frequent flyer here on the show. My goldfish so, drown tunes in a lot. So that everybody knows, this is important, we're giving away three copies of this book tonight. And we said before we even got online, and this wasn't our idea, this was actually Glenn's idea, we're going to give away a book to the first person who brings up poop, and guess who it was? My Goldfish Drown. So, you can always count on my, focus, my Goldfish Drown to bring up poop. Him or Pizza Ninja. One of the two are going to bring it up, and, and we're going to have it. So uh, definitely shoot us your email. And we'll shoot your information, <clears throat> give us all your information, uh, social security number, credit card numbers, all that stuff. And uh, we'll get that stuff over to Glenn. Okay, don't give us all that stuff, but definitely give us an address and place to ship the book and we'll get that to you. Um, we're also going to be giving away two more books as we go along. And I, I kind of like not telling people what, oh, yeah. what we want I them do to do in order to like get the books. Your own insider info. And yeah. my goal is drown. Now, this hasn't failed us yet. But uh, send us an email at backpackingpodcast at gmail.com. One, two, three, four, I declare a thumb war in the subject line. Uh, otherwise, I'll have to delete your email. Okay? One, two, three, four, right I declare a thumb war. That's yeah. it right there. So That's it right let there. me tell you my two favorite pieces of gear. Look at him he's shaking his head. <laughs> like I've been on the show 30 minutes. Oh my <laughs> this guy's ridiculous. I can We're tell you guys have small kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I have. My first kid is on He's the way, arriving July 20th. Yeah. You ready? But, uh, yeah, I'm excited. So, very, very popular piece of gear, Gossamer Gear Sales, is the LT5s. They are trekking poles, and they're like the lightest ones around that, that I found. But the piece of gear that I don't think you'd ever expect is the coolest design on a hat that I have seen. Now, I'm a little bit biased because I am a backpacker, so I'm into this. But I don't know if you know this, Gossamer Gear sells or did sell at the time of me ordering just a straight black flat bill hat, but on the front in all white, it has kind of like a cartoon gear loadout just strolled out on the floor, an organized loadout. And then at the bottom, I think in red, it says take less, do more. And that right there, I've worn that hat so much. It has burn holes in the top, burn holes from all the fires while we're out in the woods. And then the snap, I've taken it on and off so many times and adjusted. My hair gets longer. It gets matted down. Taking it off my backpack, the snap is basically falling apart. Would you, would you ever guess that the hat is going to come out to be somebody's favorite piece? I would not, but if you mail me your hat, I will fix the snap. 
Oh, well. well. Check that I out. I appreciate that. Yeah, I might just I take can, you I, up on it. I can see how important it is to you. Happy to happy to do that. And he wore that hat all the time. I mean, okay, well, wash it first before you, before you mail it. I guarantee it smells <laughs> awful. Guarantee it smells <laughs> awful. I did just wear it on my last backpacking trip and the okay. one before that. And it's my daily go to. Yeah. Sometimes I got to hide this hair. Yeah, it's yeah. not a problem I have anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what are you hiding under that hat? <laughs> nothing. That's why I got the hat on. I got nothing to keep me warm. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. My, I have, I have an eight head. If my hat keeps going back and it looks like I'm bald, but there's hair back there, it just starts back here. So there you, go. you know, oh, I roll you with both. what I got. Let's put it that way. There and, you go. and we have our next winner. Oh my goodness! They didn't wow. even know that they had it. Our next winner, unlikely hiker. My favorite GG item is the Kumo. Fantastic pack. Wow, Melissa. So we I'm got our person with their Gossamer gear item. So you know what to do. One, two, three, four, out of clear thumb war. Send it to us at backpackingpodcast at gmail.com. We will get you set up for a free book. We got one one left. We got one left. That's it. Just <laughs> one left. We'll now, I was going to say, my favorite piece of gear is uh, actually this umbrella. And that's not a joke. Like, especially in the summer here in Kentucky, it gets so humid and hot. And I hate, I hate it when it rains because then I have to wear that stupid raincoat and sweat. And I wore that last year in July on a hiking trip. I did I mean, like 23 miles or something uh, in a couple days. And I had that on and I was able to carry my expensive camera on my chest without worrying about it getting soaked. I didn't sweat while I was hiking through the rain. It was the most beautiful, wonderful, amazing thing in the entire world, and it weighs less than any raincoat I own. So I just think it's a great piece of gear. Plus, it keeps you out of the sun when it gets super hot. So I never yeah, thought I'd I... say an umbrella would be something I would like, but that umbrella yeah. has been awesome. That's that's surprising, but not surprising. I was hiking in uh, Italy last year, year before, and um never been a big umbrella fan not because i've tried them but just because i have such a rate uh, such a light rain jacket that i kind of you know it used it's my shell my windshell basically yeah. and so to me an umbrella was going to add weight because i'd still need the rain shell so maybe my rain shell you know maybe my windshell saves me an ounce over the rain shell but the umbrella is more than an ounce but I was a believer, you know, like you, once I used it, if you're yeah. like all day in the rain, just not having it drip around your head. Now I had a little tiny umbrella, which was definitely suboptimal, but I, I made a note to myself like, Hey, next time when I think it's going to rain, it's like, I'm going to try one of those big umbrellas. Cause that thing was the bomb. <laughs> yeah. I, I took it. Um, I went on the foothills trail a couple years ago. And the first day, it just poured the rain. And I decided, you know what? I'm not going to do the raincoat. I'm going to wear this and see how it does. And, man, it was awesome. I mean, I I always hate hiking in a raincoat. I hate it because you always end up sweating as much under the raincoat as what you would have gotten wet from the rain. And the sweat smells worse. So it's yeah. like I just decided I'm going to try, try this, this thing out. And, uh, man, it was awesome. It was just awesome. And now I know there's some places where you can't do it because the – trail gets two in on you and there's trees and it, it would just tear the umbrella up, but yeah. Or if you, open, yeah. yeah if you got high wind. Yeah. Yeah. If you got high wind, that's another situation. It's not great, but yeah. Yeah. For the right conditions. And it's, well, I love it. Since we're talking umbrellas here, I'll tell you, I took that umbrella across the whole Camino and let me just forewarn you. If you are going to be an umbrella user, you have to be confident because whenever I was doing the Camino, I did get made fun of by some different people. I don't know if they do it in different, different parts of the world or what. I did meet this girl who is also a traveler and we ended up becoming friends. She was like, yeah, you know, the first time I met you uh, or not met you, but saw you, you had that umbrella. See, I would attach it here on my shoulder strap because I wanted hands-free shade. Everybody else is walking around. You know, it's 90 degrees. They're sweating. The sun's just beaming down on them. No shade anywhere. And here I am, yada, 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 walking down the trail with my umbrella attached, totally hands-free, using both trekking poles. 
And she said, yeah, the first time I saw you, you had that umbrella on. It wasn't raining or anything. You were just wearing an umbrella around. And she said, I took a video of you. I said, no way. You got to send me that video. So I have the video of her following me around from behind. And you just see me walking down the trail, with, you know, dancing along with my trekking poles and my suspended umbrella. That thing is legit. I'm curious. Um, I don't think you'll mind me asking because I see this picture in your book. You you know Ron Moak, right? Is that how you say his last name? That's uh well, yeah, different accent, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> accent, what the get in a punch? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, um, Six Moons Designs, um, they have this umbrella as well. I'm wondering who did it first, Gossamer Gear or Six Moons Designs on the umbrella? You know, I'm just going to say Six Moon Design did it because that's what Ron's going to say anyway. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> It looks like y'all went to... Uh, the Cascades, 2011? Uh, that sounds right. Oh, no, yeah. no, it says uh, Founders. Yeah, yeah. Brain Trust Hike by oh, early yeah. Ultra Backpacker Gear Company founders in the Casc Cascades. Yeah, you got several uh, great pictures in your book. It seems that you strategically placed them in a perfect spot. So I had just. I'd learn all the characters. I'd learn le many lessons, not to blow smoke, but I do want to tell you, I was telling John this before you hopped on. Um, I was reading this book, Take Less, Do More, Surprising Life Lessons. And I was like, I'm, th I'm 31, okay? So I've graduated college. I've worked 10 years in my career, but I just keep somehow ending up in hard knock university. You know, you keep learning these lessons throughout life. And it, what it seems to me that you've done in this book is compile life lessons that I'm learning right now, but I don't know how to articulate them. So you did a fantastic job articulating them here. And I'm wondering, how, how did the process even come along of writing this book? Because you've done a lot in your life, and obviously you have something to say because you're putting in this book for, you know, to spread to others. What does that process even look like? How do you organize your ideas and how does it go from just an idea to now it's in my hand? Well, uh, it's a process and, and Jeremiah, I don't know if this is helpful. We had a pastor that always used to talk about paying the dumb tax and mm -hmm. he said, you know, when you, when you, when you make bad decisions and bad things happen or hard knocks, like you say, he says, that's like paying a dumb tax. You know, you, you pay the tax to learn the lesson basically. But he said, the good news is, is you don't have to pay the tax. You can let someone else pay the tax. If you're paying attention and, and you watch them pay the dumb tax, then you can make a different decision. So I don't know if that's helpful, but, um, some lessons we just have to learn ourselves. That's, that's the way we remember them. Yep. Uh, but as far as, as far as the book, you know, I, it's been, I guess, depending on how far back you want to go. I mean, it's, I've been working on it for two years, um, but probably about 10 years ago now, uh, my friend John Mackey, co-founder of Whole Foods Market, we're hiking along and, and he says, Glenn, you ought to write a book. And I said, eh, you know, there's plenty of great books about ultralight backpacking. I don't think I need to add my two cents to it. Uh, but one of John's many characteristics is persistence. Um, and so <laughs> year after year, uh, after... <laughs> I'd be hiking with him and he'd keep bringing up like, yeah, how's that book going? Eh, you know, I don't think I need to do a book. And then pretty soon he got his friends going on it. So finally, and he said, I'll write the forward. And I thought, well, probably not too many people have John Mackey offering to write the forward of their book. I probably ought to do something about taking advantage of that before he forgets or, you know, decides to retract the offer. So I finally, um, uh, found someone to like a collaborator to help organize the ideas and kind of, so we would just have like long interviews. I'd write some stuff, just ship everything to her. And then she'd start to kind of organize it into some kind of method. And it went through a couple different changes and then in editing, it got changed all again. Um, 
but it's a process. My mom had a saying, she said, you know, when you don't know how to do something, just find the smartest, best people you can and then do what they tell you. Um, so that was my, that was my process. Well, that's great advice. I love it. Now there are two things I want to bring up from the book. Um, one of them is right at the very beginning, uh, where you talked about how you like to take groups of people that don't know each other. And the only thing they have in common is that they know you on backpacking trips. I'm actually going on a trip in a couple weeks where there are 17 people that are going to be on this trip. I think I know two of them. Um, what what got you to doing trips like this? Well, it was actually my friend John Mackey. He uh, he likes to backpack, and he has a wide variety of friends. Um, he's got friends who are multi multi millionaires and have multiple jets, and he's got friends uh, that were the first in their family to graduate from high school, um, and you know friends who graduate high school and that's it to friends that have multiple PhDs. So his only, he just likes people that are interesting people and good company on the trail. That's like his criteria. And so, you know, he invites a bunch of people on these trips and whoever can make it goes. And so, I mean, I've met amazing people on John Mackey trips. And so that was kind of the genesis for me creating the list, what I call, so it was about 60, 70 people and I'll get some permits and, you know, send out a blind copy to the list and whoever responds first, um, they're on the trip. And so it's typically, they don't know each other. It's, you know, I'm the common connection, but they go on to, to make friends and sometimes do trips on their own. So and that's, John, that's pretty yeah. incredible. I saw him on Joe Rogan's podcast, had no idea who he was or anything about him. And then uh, there's no Whole Foods where I live, by the way. It's rural Kentucky. So the nearest one's like an hour and a half away. So never heard of the guy. And then I saw him on Joe Rogan's podcast. And, you know, they've done this long-form interview. And whenever you're going to talk for two or three hours, you know, your interests are going to come up. And he started talking to him about backpacking. And I was like, hold on a second. And then I looked a little more into him. And I was just listening to this episode, and he's talking about backpacking. And I was just so thirsty for it. And I was like, man. How amazing would it be if he could get Joe Rogan into backpacking? Because he already does these uh, these elk trips in Colorado where he's rucking 80 pounds at a time if he kills an elk or something. He's just one step away from backpacking like you, Glenn, an ultralighter. Yeah. And I was thinking, yeah. man, if we could get him into the fold, that's a lot of push and could could spread a lot of greatness when it comes to the backpacking. That would be Well, and there's cool. so much that happens in the wilderness. Um I don't know if you guys have read um, The Comfort Crisis. No. I have not. Who's yes, that, Bob? Uh, Michael Easter. Easter. Okay. No, I haven't read that. <laughs> amazing, amazing book. I mean, I would say buy my book, too, because that'll help the Pacific Coast Trail <laughs> Association. You know, I'm not, I'm not taking any money from the book. But if you can only buy one, I might buy The Comfort Crisis. Um you know, he talks about the, I mean, so many things, but the power of wilderness and how we've done such a good job in our modern society of creating comfort for ourselves that it's killing us, really. Um, and, you know, we need to rearrange our lives so it includes time outside. And, you know, even like as simple as 20 minutes in nature three times a week, but then also some longer trips, kind of the three day rule, you know, it takes three days to kind of forget about all the, you know, your wife and your kids and your job and everything else, all these to do lists. Um, by day three, I'm sure you guys have experienced this. You're just, your mind's empty of all that stuff. And you have time to just think about things that you don't normally get time to think about and just ponder them. Or when you're hiking with other people, you get a chance to talk with them probably about things that you haven't talked to anybody about because you've got all the time in the world and nothing to do but walk and think and talk. Yeah. I always say the campfire is one of the best places to hang out because everybody sits and talks. It doesn't matter who you are. Something about a campfire just changes everything. It's a cool yeah, place to be around. 
I read a fascinating thing, and it might have been in uh, the Comfort Crisis. Might have been another book. They were talking about the the development of man, and they talked about, you know, before fire. Okay, you know, you went out and hunted or gathered during the day, and then it was dark. It was like, okay, well now you're prey, so you get in the cave, you know, and put a rock in the entrance or whatever. But that fire kind of extended the day. So it wasn't, you know, you couldn't go out and hunt and gather because you didn't have that much light, but you had light to sit around. You could, you know, sew things, mend your bows and arrows or whatever, but it was time to talk. And that's when, you know, you can transfer knowledge. You can start to talk about things and create stories and, and legends and culture. You know, it's really that, that campfire that that created that opportunity that's interesting i've never heard that before i have a, a very very important question to ask you about well i i, I you, you cut me off before i got my other question in oh go ahead go ahead john don't cut me off jeremiah don't cut me oh, off. You too. That's don't hog this interview jeremiah sorry um, sorry I, so i'm so curious this is the most important question of the whole time of the whole thing um oh, i don't know about the that. most important question i can ask you mentioned that you were trying to teach boy scouts how to um, how to pack ultra light, and that you and one of the other scoutmasters decided to do a Hans and Franz sketch. <laughs> Can you still do your Austrian accent to this day? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. How do do that? I just wanted to know because I've always been curious. What does Glenn Van Pesky sound like when he talks like Hans and Franz? I I just didn't know. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that might so, be one of those had to be there kind of things. Had to be there. And it was, you know, before <laughs> cell phones, so there's no video <laughs> proof of it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. The whole time I'm reading that, I'm imagining it in my head, and I am dying laughing because I remember you know, Hans I, and Franz. I probably should contact Ken Hollister and, like, arrange for someone to video, like, a Hans and Franz just so there'd be, like, a – people go to YouTube and actually see a Hans and Franz. Yeah, with all Gossamer Gear gear, you know? Yeah. It'd be the next big course. commercial for Gossamer Gear. Yeah, there you go. Okay, well, I'll put that on the list. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question um, is twofold. <laughs> very, very important as well. What was it like backpacking with Matthew McConaughey and deciding who holds his poop? So... <laughs> Matthew McConaughey. Like, hold on. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey was uh, was uh, is is the friend of a friend. He's not my personal friend, um, but uh, you know. So I have a I have criteria for people that get on my list, and uh, it's three criteria. The first is they got to be like interesting people. Um, that uh, are good company on the trail. You know, they're good company in the back country, in the wilderness. Um, second is they need to be like reasonably fit uh, for the trips I do and they have to have their gear lined up. So my shorthand for this is people who have something to say but nothing to prove. So it's people that you know, they've got great stories. They're willing to engage. They're interested in what other people are about and the stories they have. Um, but they don't have to be the center of attention. And Michael, uh, Matthew McConaughey was exactly like that. I mean, he obviously, the guy's a consummate storyteller. You know, we heard when I um, got his book uh, and listened to it, I'd heard some of those stories before, you know, in the canyon, uh, definitely. Um but he doesn't, he doesn't have to be the center of attention. Um, you know, he's interested in other people and their stories and learning from them. So yeah, he was good company. Oh, that's awesome. That sounds great. Now oh, we do have some comments. Bag. We do have some comments and one has been Wait. put up here twice. So I've got to make sure it shows up because okay. uh, Huck Outdoors put on here for many years. Gossamer gear has supported the Los Padres forest association by donating gear to be used gear for to, to the used gear sales. Uh, many social hikers thank Glenn for the donations. So I wanted to make sure yeah, that one a, got in there for you. That's a great story. Uh, Rick Christensen, who 
uh, died recently, and uh, Paul Cronshaw, B Man is his trail name. They were, uh, this was early, early days, so not a lot of GVP gear or Gossamer gear out there. And uh, they both lived kind of in the Santa Barbara area. And um, Rick was hiking in, and I think Paul was hiking out, and they, they both kind of noticed like that they were carrying G4 packs or whatever it was when that was like a rare thing. Um, you know, like driving a cyber truck today or something. It's like, you don't see too many. Um, so they both kind of said, Hey, you know, and, and became fast friends. Um, and both of them were volunteers in the Los Padres and Rick was super handy with the sewing machine. So all our, you know, bashed up gear, we'd send it to him and he'd fix it up and they'd, sell it to, to, um, raise funds for the volunteer association there. That's incredible. Fantastic. And what about the poop? So oh. I don't carry anyone's poop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Why are you famous? Stuff. You are, you're carrying your own you poop. Carry people's poop. That's right. You hike <laughs> alone, you carry your poop alone. Yeah. Hey, the trail oh. evens out the playing field. That's all that matters. That's the trail right. Trail evens out the playing field. That's true. So, well, where is the best place for people to go if they want to check out your book and get a copy? Uh, well, as of tomorrow, um, April 16th, it will be on sale anywhere. Um, I know Backpacking Light is selling it. Gosh, McGear is going to have it up on the site soon. And I think the first hundred Gosh, McGear copies will be signed copies. Um, Lightsmith.com has, uh, has some copies. And then, of course, the regular Amazon. And you can, you know, if you want to support your local bike sh or uh, local bookstore, they can order it for you too. And you guys can go on over to glennvanpesky.com and uh, check out all kinds of stuff about Glenn. Uh, this, it's that is a, a. I went there the moment we got the email uh, to to have you on the show, and just did some research. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you, man. You are a very fascinating person. Just the your his it just. I wish we had more time to talk about things outside of backpacking because uh, entrepreneurially, is that a word? Um, you've done a lot of really cool things. And uh, I, I encourage anybody who's, who's listening or watching to go check that, that website out because there's some great stuff on the website about you, uh, the person, and just kind of the things that you've done throughout your life. And it's, it, it's a lot of fun to go research that and see it. See, and I, I don't think I'm that fascinating. I mean, it's just, it's just my life. But what I do find is that like most anyone, if you walk with them for a couple of weeks, they're fascinating. I mean, Absolutely. everyone is fascinating. We just don't normally have the time to, to delve into it. You know, it's kind of like, Hey, I'll meet you for coffee. And it's like, okay, I got to go to my next appointment. We don't have a chance to find out what people are really about. Yeah. But the website was nice to be able to kind of accumulate all the stuff that people ask me for over the years, like, you know, gear lists and what I think about food and first aid and all that kind of stuff. So it's nice having it all in one place. Yeah. yeah. I'll leave you with this. Ben McMillan commented on here. If you took a liking to it, Jeremiah can read the audio book. So you just let me know, send the check in the mail. I'll take care of that audio book for you. If you like the accent, Glenn. The, the and, problem is uh, Jeremiah, he wants people to understand the words of the book. So we may not, we may not want to go that route. And, um, now if you want to make an Appalachian copy of it, well, th that's what I'm thinking, like a no, different translation, you. Yeah. you know, I mean, I, I'm thinking we may have to translate it into Japanese and French. And, you know, when we get to Appalachian, I mean, I just uh -huh. definitely, it's right hard there. work though, Jeremiah, I will tell oh. you, I, I, I did not, I did not read it myself. I did a 15 minute test and remembered my mom's words like no no hire some people that know what they're doing and let them do it <laughs> just pay them to do it <laughs> yeah here's here's a little trivia fact for you when you record an audiobook it's actually less expensive to hire a professional narrator than it is to narrate it yourself really yeah because the cleanup the the editing and cleanup is a lot more if you're doing it yourself interesting Wow. Interesting. Well, Girls I am wisdom outside of the backpacking world. <clears throat> and if you think this accent sounds good in English, you should hear me speak in Spanish. I mean, it is a totally <laughs> different world. Well, when, when you were, uh, Jeremiah, I have to admit, when, when you were talking about 
people making fun of you on the Camino for your umbrella. I, yeah. the, what flashed through my mind was, are you sure they weren't just laughing at you? <laughs> accent <laughs> <laughs> yeah they probably thought i was speaking some other language <laughs> well, we can't thank you enough for being on here man uh, we appreciate you uh, if you're cool with hanging out in the green room for just a second we're gonna sure. we're gonna get signed off here but we would love to chat with you just for a minute before before we uh get you out bet. and we got that last book to give away somehow right yeah. uh, and I've, I've got it planned i'm gonna let you watch how we do it because this is gonna okay. be a fun one. this is gonna be a fun one because i can't remember what we talked about before so i've changed it all change it all so we'll see you in just a second glenn thanks again all right so here's the here's the deal jeremiah i have done a compilation of jeremiah comments from tonight's podcast oh my god and i simply want you to pick out your favorite jeremiah comment okay you're not going to tell me who said it you're just going to say what the comment is yes and then i will bring up the person uh, who said it? Okay, so the first one is Jeremiah could come out with his own recipes for the crotch pot and sell it as merch. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, what email do I use to get Jeremiah merch? Obviously, there are merch comments. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a legit question How can Gossamer Gear help Jeremiah make his own merch? Oh, boy, they're on the merch tonight. <laughs> and then I don't know where this one came from. It says Jeremiah starting a new cult. <laughs> are you starting a cult? That's a new one. And then, then you, you actually said the last one, uh, can, can you have Jeremiah read for the audiobook? So, uh, which comment Jeremiah would you like to pick as your winner? Well, people are going to say it was rigged, but I'm going to say the last one. So that would be our good friend, Ben McMillan over at Hilltop packs. Ben, I think Just we have your info, but send it to us anyways. <laughs> and we'll get the book and Melissa too. Unlikely hiker. I've hiked yes. with her quite a bit. Yeah. Just shoot me a text. Yeah. Tonight's been fun, man. This was great. Um, love having guys like Glenn on here who just have a wealth of, of wisdom from the trail that uh, we can we can glean. And also, uh, unfortunately, we never got that Hans and Franz from him. I was really disappointed <laughs> in that. I was really hoping. But uh, maybe that'll be for the next time. Maybe we can get it back on here again. <laughs> and we can do that. <laughs> it was a joy, man. That was a it great, was fun interview. Great conversation. It was absolutely awesome. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in to the Backpacking Podcast brought to you by Outdoor Vitals. We will catch you on the next one. Yeah. Adios, folks.